thanks to God for my Redeemer. Thanks for all thou dost provide. Thanks for time, but now a memory. Thanks for Jesus at my side. Thanks for pleasant, balmy springtime. Thanks for dark and dreary fall. Thanks for tears, but now for God. Within my soul, thanks for prayers that thou hast answered, thanks for what thou dost deny, thanks for storms that I have weathered, thanks for all thou dost supply, thanks for pain and thanks for pleasure, thanks for comfort in despair, thanks for grace that none can make. stems contain. Thanks for home and thanks for fireside. Thanks for hope, that sweet refrain. Thanks for joy and thanks for sorrow. Thanks for heavenly peace with thee. Thanks for hope and in the morrow. Thanks through all eternity. Amen. I like that. Thanks for roses. And the thorns. <laughs> Thanks for both, right? Amen. You can be seated for a moment. Turn to Psalm 100. Amen. <laughs> Psalm 100. going to be in Psalm 100. We're talking about giving thanks, being thankful. Now, in these last days, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 2, the Bible says, verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth, truce bracers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. The Bible here listed among the, the character traits of the last days, unthankful. And as Christians, over in 1 Thessalonians, in verse 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18, the Bible says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. A lot of us ask, what is the will of God for my life? Here's one. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. These last days will be marked by a selfish people that love pleasures more than they love God. And here God asks us, according to his will in Christ Jesus, that we be thankful, giving thanks in all things. And so as we turn to Psalm chapter 100, I just wanted to talk about one of the most important wills of God. You only find a handful of the times in the Bible where God just says, this is my will for you. One of them is that all men would believe on him and trust him for salvation. Here we have the will of God to be thankful in everything. Even as you're thankful for the beautiful rose, be thankful for the thorn that just pricked your finger. As the, psalm went, the song went. Let me read with you Psalm chapter 100. Follow along in your Bible. A psalm of praise. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. 
It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Make a joyful noise, verse 1 says unto God. Make a joyful noise. I'm glad it doesn't say make a skillful noise or an expert sound. Singing key all the time. God wants us to rejoice with a noise, nothing more. Right? He doesn't expect us to be perfect singers when we sing unto him. He doesn't expect us to be on key all the time. A shout, a grunt even, if you can muster it, is enough to be a joyful noise unto God. Let's rejoice in him and make it verbal. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. He says, all ye lands, not just his people, the whole world, ought to rejoice and sing with joy unto God. Make a joyful noise. In Psalm chapter 7, I'm just going to... Rip through a few psalms to just drive the point home about God and his expectation that we would sing. Psalm chapter 7 and verse 17. I'm going to be quick through here. It says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. In 9 and verse 2, it says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O most high. 13 and verse 6. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Look at verse chapter 18 and verse 46. It says, The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest up Leftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. 27 and verse 6. 27 verse 6. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me, Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. What is that? I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. We can still sacrifice in the New Testament, can't we? By singing unto God. 30 and verse 4. 30 and verse 4. It says, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Be thankful for how holy he is and show it by singing praises unto his holy name. Going back to Psalm 100. Here God says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. He used David to pen these words, and they are so true. Be joyful in singing praise unto him. The second part there of verse 2 It says, come before his presence with singing. And I only took a small section of the book of Psalms, but it's full of them. Sing, sing, sing praises unto God. And he says a joyful noise. You don't have to be an expert singer, a trained singer. Hit all the notes. Just hum unto the Lord. Look, my little son, Caleb, you think he can hit all all the notes? You think he he can sing all the songs perfect? No, but it doesn't matter when his voice rings out and he's singing a song out of key and forgetting half the words. It brings such joy to my heart. And your father's the same. You don't know all the words, but you're humming along and you're trying to rejoice. And we brought up some new hymns today and you didn't know them. But if you were humming along and singing half the words, God is rejoicing. He looks at you just as I look at my little child when he sings. A child's voice is beautiful, even if it's not perfect as we would have it. Make a joyful noise. Come before his presence with singing. A great way to enter into your prayer time is to sing unto the Lord. Hum a hymn. Go to the hymn books. You're free to take one home with you. And sing one of your favorites. Ask God to give you a hymn each and every day as you wake up. And he did that for me. I would wake up with rock and roll music in my head. And I, I wanted nothing to do with that filth anymore. I said, God... Wake me with a hymn. Wake me with a a beautiful song. I don't care if it's Jesus loves me. Every single day I'll sing that song to you. And and God began to work that into my life. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. 
and gradually my repertoire increased, right? I started to learn more songs, but, you know, it doesn't start that way. But God rejoices all the same when you make a joyful noise unto him. That's one way we can give thanks unto God is make a joyful noise as you come into his presence. Another way that we can be thankful and show our thankfulness unto God, verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Keep your finger there. Go to Romans chapter 12. He says that we're to sing with joy and we're to serve the Lord with gladness. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, here's New Testament service. In a nutshell, verse 12, chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here's another case. Not only singing, but sacrifice comes by presenting yourself. Holy, acceptable unto him. That's your reasonable service. Now, how do we do that? What does that even mean to present your body? Are you laying it upon an altar and letting your blood spill out? No. Well, look at this in verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, okay? So this is a spiritual sacrifice, even as singing was. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here it is again, the will of God, what is it? That ye be not conformed to this world, that ye be not as this world would have you to be. Turn on MTV. Open up the magazines and look at the ads. Don't be like that. Don't be conformed to this world and what they would have you to be. But be transformed, not by your image, right? We don't just take somebody and, and, and put them in a suit and say, look, you're transformed. We don't just take a lady and put her in a dress and say, look, you're, you're transformed now. No, transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where it starts, in your mind, in your heart is where you get transformed first. First cleanse the inside of the cup that the outside may appear clean also. Otherwise, we end up like hip hypocrites, don't we? If we just go about and clean the outside of the cup, but there's dead men bones on the inside, we're just like the Pharisees. But God wants us to be transformed by renewing our minds present our bodies, this is a reasonable service. Transform your mind and don't be conformed. What the Bible's saying here is that our service, which is a way of showing thanks to God, right? He saved us that we should do good works, correct? We ought to do good works because he did all the work to save us. He went all the way to the cross for you. All you had to do was believe, and he says that you should do good works after you show your thankfulness for all he did by what? Being transformed by the renewing of your mind, by presenting your body a living sacrifice, even as he presented his body a living and then dying sacrifice for you. Service starts then, okay, with sacrifice of self. That's what this is saying here. Look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me. Okay, so Paul's talking from the perspective of having received the grace of God and been saved. To every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So your mind ought not puff yourself up thinking God saved you because you're so wonderful. It ought to humble you to think God has saved you and, 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 and set forth his son to die on the cross for you. And that should bring you into a lowliness of mind. And when you're lowly in mind beneath the king of kings, lord of lords, you're in a position of servitude, aren't you? You're in a position of being humble and being willing to do whatever God would have you to do. And here, his will is, first of all, we saw to give thanks and everything. But secondly, his will is that you would present yourself a living sacrifice. In other words, live your life in sacrifice unto him. In other words, it's not my will, but thine be done. Isn't that what Christ showed us as an example while he was here? He suffered in service to God. He, he went without in service to God. He, 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 he gave unto others and was a giver in service to God. And you can show your thanks for the salvation God gave you by being 
a servant unto him. Verse 9, I'll just read quickly. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Here's some examples. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. This is how you serve God. Look, you're serving others. Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You serve God and and show you're thankful for what he did by being a servant and by being submissive unto others. In other words, there's nothing special about me, so I will willingly put you above me. I will, I will repeatedly lift up others while abasing myself. I'm not wise in my own conceits. I'm humble and having that attitude, rejoicing in hope, being with others when they are suffering, not slothful, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, abhorring that which is evil and, and, and loving that which is good and cleaving unto. This is some examples of what serving God means, and we ought to do it with gladness. Okay, we ought to do all of this service with gladness. Not of compulsion, not of mandate. This isn't a list that you must do because God says so, though God did say so, didn't he? We ought to serve God, go to 2 Corinthians 5, not of compulsion, with gladness, and because of constraint, you're turning to the right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're doing this simply because our heart wants to show love for the God that first loved us. Yeah. This is called being thankful. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all then we're all dead look at that it's christ's love that extended first to us that is actually the inhibiting factor in our sending love out the conclusion simple if christ died for everybody we we're all dead in trespasses and sins the book of ephesians in chapter 2 says you're dead in trespasses and sins, but we are made alive. We talked about that last week. Because the love of Christ extended to us in this fashion. Verse 15, And that he died for all that they which live, watch this, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Show your thankful that God died for you and rose again by serving him, not living unto yourself, but where God wants you to live is not even necessarily just unto him, but loving others. Serve the Lord. Love the Lord. Look at the two greatest commandments. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. In service to the world around you, you're showing your love for God. You're showing your thankfulness that he hath saved you. It's the love of Christ which reached out and saved you, and it's the love of Christ which will constrain you, if you let it, to serve others, to love others, and to love God above all things. Serve him with gladness, not of compulsion. Serve him with constraint for the love that he put upon you. I'm constrained. i got to love because God so loved me. I just can't help it. If you don't have that in your heart, hey, this isn't, this isn't a works-based sanctification here. If you don't have love for others, just say, God, help me to love my brethren. You commanded it. Help me to do it. And he will. He'll show you his love so you can show others his love. And that'll constrain you and, 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 and draw you unto more service unto him. Serve the Lord. So to be thankful and show your thankfulness to God, make a joyful noise. Go back to Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto him. Enter into his presence with singing. Next is serve him. Serve him with all. Present your body in service unto him. Next in verse 3, watch this. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know him. Philippians chapter 3. 
Oh, I'm sorry to rush you back over there so quickly, but you know how I love turning in my Bible. Philippians chapter 3. Keep your finger in Psalm 100. Philippians chapter 3. He just said, Know ye that the Lord, He is God. I'm going to say that that's telling you to know Him. Know He is God, His position, but know who He is. Philippians chapter 3. And in verse 7, it says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Here the Apostle Paul's talking about when he was the Pharisee of the Pharisees, when he was doing all the sacrifices, when he was doing all the good works, when he was, when he was living the Christian life, but he was lost as anything. He says, all those things I counted as lost for Christ. Verse 8, yea, doubtless... And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Look, he, he's accounting that everything in this life is but loss, save for what Christ has allowed him to gain. The knowledge of Christ Jesus his Lord was placed above all things. He lost many things, but here he's counting them as dung, of no worth, of no value, that he may win Christ. He's saying the focus is Christ. He's willing to lose all that he may know him. And he's about to say that. Verse 9, and be found in him. Look, he wants to win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Look, he did the works thing. He did the mine own righteousness thing, and he wants to put it away that he may win Christ. That he may be found faithful in the righteousness which is of God. The only righteousness that is true is the one that is through God. Mine own righteousnesses are filthy rags before him. That's just like dumb. Just presenting something that's of no value, of no worth, even filthy and disgusting. Look at verse 10. He just said he, he wants to win Christ. He says he's counting all things but loss. He's saying he wants the righteousness which is of God by faith. And he's saying, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. He says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. He wants to know him and the power that him rising from the dead gives him. The Apostle Paul lived a decent and good Christian life by all standards. Carnally speaking, he penned most of the New Testament. He was an example to us, of course. A great and godly man, but he did it in the righteousness of God. And he did it because he knew him. He knew God. Not just knew about God. Not just knew facts about God. Not just could quote the Bible. He knew him and the power of his resurrection. And so the Apostle Paul to this day will tell you, all of my righteousnesses are as filthy rags, but the righteousness that came by faith, when I knew God, when he gave me power through his resurrection to overcome sins of self-righteousness, that's lasting. And when that happened, he entered into fellowship with them. Here, the fellowship of the sufferings of God, right? Because all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. Because those that live righteously set a mark on their back. So he was made conformable unto the death. Verse 11, if by any means that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. That's that constraining factor. He's been apprehended by Jesus. He's been taken by Jesus. Caught up. I can't but serve God. I can't but follow him. That's the power that his resurrection has over a believer. If you don't have that, ask for that. God wants us to be conformable unto his death. He wants us to die daily to self. He wants us to serve him. He wants us to have that joyful noise because it's just us showing our thankfulness unto him when we do these things. And what was the command there? And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
Verse 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Just, just in case you, you think the Apostle Paul's telling you he's made it. He's figured this thing out. But watch this. Here's an example for you. If you've not found yourself to have apprehended, to have made it, to, to be righteous enough. He says, this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We just need to confess and forget. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how the Apostle Paul is able to sin today and forget about it tomorrow and move on because he has faith that God will hold to that promise. He confessed it. Lord, I've fallen short. I'm pressing on. Forgive me that sin. Forgive me that trespass. Press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And today you have that same high calling. It starts with knowing him. Knowing him. Go back to Psalm chapter 100. We need to know him, the Bible says. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Know that he is God. It continues on, it says, It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. Just in case anyone's confused about that fact. We didn't make ourselves. We didn't create ourselves. God made us. It is he that made us and not we ourselves. It says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Whether it's your first birth into this life, he made you. Or it's the second birth into a new life redeemed in heaven with Christ, he made you. He is the creator. He is the giver of life. He is life. You need to know him. Know that he is God. He made us. In other words, because he made us, he has power over us. Because he made us, he has purpose for us. You don't make something with, and have no use for it. Whenever you, whenever you fashion or create anything, you're in construction. You build something for a purpose, right? God made us for a purpose. He has power over us, even as the potter does his clay. And when the potter mixes that clay and spins it and gets it, it was for a purpose. It's a bowl, it's a vase, whatever it is. God had power to make us and purpose for us. And it says we are his. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And because we are his, he has care over us. So God isn't just, I've got power over you. And I've got a purpose for you. But he also has care for us. As a shepherd does his sheep, he wants to lead us in paths of righteousness. He wants to lead us in that way of peace. But the world doesn't know. But we can know that way of peace. When you give God the proper place, you give him the right fear, which is reverence and respect, and just know him. Know who he is. Know what he is to you. Get to know him in that time of prayer. That I may know him was the Apostle Paul's ultimate end. And he's like, I haven't apprehended but this one thing I do, when I mess up, I forget those things which are past and I press on. Because why? Those things are dumb. Whether they're good or whether they're bad, whether he did good works or bad works, it's all but loss and dung because I'm pressing towards the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Have that mindset. Don't let yesterday bog you down for the tomorrow that's ahead. Chase after God. Get after God. Know God. And trust that God's not holding yesterday against you if you simply confessed it, repented in your heart and said, Lord, I messed up. I sinned. Forgive me. Forgiven. Let's move on. That's what God wants to do in our lives. It's us that holds our own sins upon our shoulders. God says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our sin and transgressions from us. Okay? Think about how far east is from west. Travel east until you hit west. <laughs> You'll never catch up. But well, you know what we do? We stay still and we let our sins dwell upon us. We get guilty. We get bogged down. And we ruin the chance that we have in the Christian life to move on to the, the next step. Confess and forsake and move on. God is faithful and just. You doubt it? You doubt God's not going to forgive you as he promised? 
And this is just another example of us showing our thankfulness for him when we try to get to know him. But God saved us so that that relationship between us could be repaired. Okay, don't go on living like you're lost. You, you don't know the Savior and you have no access to Him. God promises you have access into the Father through Christ Jesus. You can step boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrew lore will tell you that when the priest entered once a year, I've never seen this in the Bible, what they talk about is that they would put a, they would put a rope and a bell on the, the high priest when he went in once a year after doing all the ceremonial cleansings, after bringing the blood of the perfect, most perfect spotless lamb they could find, he would go in with a bell and a rope. And the people on the outside would know that when that bell stopped dinging, it probably means that the priest had some sin in his life he didn't deal with and God struck him dead. And then they would use the rope to pull him out. Okay, that's Hebrew lore. That's not gospel, but... The, the, the truth that we can take from a story like that is that it is true that in the Old Testament, they could not step boldly before the throne of grace. Once a year, not without blood, was the command to Aaron. There was a whole ritual for cleansing. There was a whole attire and garb he had to wear. There was a rigmarole and a structure that he had to go through to get in there. And I don't think he went boldly. I mean, when you got to pray, prepare and do all these things, and it's once a year, and he's not only going in for his own sins, he's going in for the sins of the people. I figure with that blood, I'd be like, I'm sorry, Lord, right? <laughs> Boldness is what God gives us through Christ. Why? Because he was the perfect lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and he was the perfect high priest to go and bring that sacrifice, and he provides the way. We go with him, we go in him, and through him, to that throne of grace to simply say, ah, oh, God, I messed up. I don't want to do it again. I probably will do it again, but please help me. Cleanse me of that sin. Let me move on. And God's like, forgiven. You can be bold. You can be yourself. You don't need to put on a certain tie to go and pray to God and ask him for forgiveness. You don't need to wear a certain dress. It's not got to be a certain time of day. Boldly step before his throne. And he wants that. He wants you to know him. Give him place, give him fear, know him, know who he is, and be thankful for who he is. Look, there's no better God to reign over us. You can't look at the gods and idols of this world and say, oh, you know what, that one's probably a little bit better. You know what most of the world does? They go, oh, I like that one a little bit better, and ultimately it's them. And they think that it's better. But I'm not so good to myself when I really boil it down and think about it. God's better to me than I am to me. Why? Because I sin, and sin confounds me and messes me up in my day. I hurt other people, and it causes my relationships to be harmed. I, I don't eat well. I don't. <laughs> just, you can just go through the rigmarole of how I treat myself, and it's not as good as God treats himself. So these atheists that make themselves into God, right? There's a better God. It's the true and living God. And he will treat you better than you even think you treat yourself. The Bible says in Romans 10, 12, the same Lord is rich unto all that call upon him. He says there there's no difference. Jew, Greek, bond, free, okay? That same Lord, the same Lord, he is rich unto all that call upon him. Without, without respect of persons, God will be rich unto all that simply call upon him and ask him. And seek him. And that's one way that we show our thankfulness. Get to know the God that saved you. Because that's what he wants more than anything. He made men for his pleasure. Don't go and try to live a life that's separate from him. Please God, be thankful for all he's done. And enter into his presence. Look at verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name enter into his presence with thanksgiving enter into his presence with praise come before his presence with singing we learned before these are all the same types of things that attitude of rejoicing as you come to god come often into his presence and not just to please yourself i know there's a time and there's a place where you need something from God, but don't let that be the only time you come to him, right? I love when my son comes to me and he's just like, I love you, daddy. 
right? And that's great. He's coming into my presence with thanksgiving. He's coming with praise. You know, Daddy, you're so strong, you know, when he says stuff like that. He's thankful unto me. He's coming and showing me that. If it was just all the time, can I have, I want, give me this, give me that, I don't need this, I want that, I want this, I want that, that gets tiresome. Certainly a father gives as he, as he needs to. He, God will always give unto his people. But think about it in the flip side. Someone's just always coming to you when they need something, need something, need something, need something, need something. Okay? And put God in those shoes. And how often do we do that? We just go and we need something. I need this. I need that. I have this problem. I have this struggle. Right? It's the only time we ever want to go seek to God. Enter into his presence with thanksgiving and praise. Being thankful for what he already gave you. Not going just simply to seek more. We need to go often and not just to please ourselves. But we need to go in order to bless him. Bless his name. God, I just want to bless you. I'm just going to sing some hymns to you. I just want to tell you how awesome you are and just you've done all these great things for me and in my life and I love you. That, that warms the Lord's heart like you wouldn't believe. I know that because when my son does it to me, how it warms my heart. And that's just, that's just minor. That's just human stuff. Imagine the God that made you for the purpose of pleasing him when you come to him. And say, God, I love you. When you go with him, go to him with singing. When you go to him and, and, and ask him to help you in, in your service to him. Lord, would you help me to just, just love my neighbor? That's got to warm his heart. Because he wants you to love your neighbor. And, and, and now he's, you're just like, I can't do it. Help me. And he's just going to enable you to it. Go with singing. Serve him with all. And know him as you're serving him. Know what God wants. And give him what he wants. What a wonderful thing that is. And do it for his benefit. Go into his presence with singing. Go into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into those courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. Do it for his benefit. Not just to always complain and harp and ask for more goodies. There's certainly a time and place for that. But let's predominantly go to God in a thankful spirit for all he has done. Look, when we weigh out all of our needs, I think we could, have you ever seen those, those uh, when people budget, they're like needs versus wants. Mm -hmm. And then they start to make their list and they're like, everything is just like a want. I don't need any of this stuff. Because our needs are like, you know, sur you know, food to live and shelter and clothing on our back are, are our needs, right? We have very few needs and, and God has provided me with every need. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I don't even, he didn't even break a sweat when he did it. Okay? But then there's other things that are wants. And God has provided me with so many wants. And he didn't even break a sweat when he did it. So do I always just need to go back and be like, I want more, I need more, I want more, I need more? Or do I just say, thank you for all that you have given me. All that you have provided me. All that you have done for me. Go back and thank him for his benefit. And because you love him, and because of all the ways that he has blessed you, enter into his courts with thanksgiving and say, thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. We'll continue on and see the wise. <laughs> Do we need him any wise? But look at this. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. There's none good, none good but one, and that's God. Some people say, oh, I'm good. I try, that at, I try not to do that at work, like, you know, oh, you're good, you know, when I'm letting people go past or something. Here, I'm, I, No, there's no one good, right? <laughs> try to get that out of my vocabulary. How are you feeling today? I'm good. Oh, I feel like I've sinned against my Lord because I'm not good. I'm not good at all, right? There's none good but one, and that's God. So rejoice in that. The Lord is good. You can praise him for that all day long. Make a joyful noise. Serve him just on the, on the shoulders of that one truth. He is good. No one is good. Nothing is good but one, and that is God. You know, there was a time when he looked upon his creation and said, it is good, and then he said, it is very good. I don't live there now, and we mucked that up within moments of it being good, didn't we? Okay? Nothing's been good here since those days until Christ walked the earth. And then it was good. He was good. He's up there in heaven now. He is good. The Lord is good. It says here, His mercy is everlasting. And aren't you glad that's true? <laughs> mercy is withholding something from us that we deserve. He's got the right to stripe us. He's got the right to correct us. He's got the, he's got the right to just, you know, take me out to the, the, the barn and just, just 
whip me until I can't stand, okay? When I think about all the ways that I've lived my life, God has the right to strike, okay? But he doesn't. His mercy endureth. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy upon me, I can't even comprehend. I'm glad that I won't have to stand in heaven because he's already forgotten my sins, cast them in the sea of forgetfulness, right? I'm glad that he won't list them when I get there. <laughs> His mercy has, has it where they're covered. They're gone. They're under the blood. Jesus took them upon him on that cross, on that tree. That was it. When I put my faith in him, they're gone. He has the right to stripe. He has the right and yet he puts his mercy upon us. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. There's a psalm in here that every line says, for his mercy endureth forever, just reminding us of that truth. And therefore, we ought to be thankful with a joyful noise. Serve him, know him, enter into his presence. Why? Because his mercy endureth forever. He could have, he, he could have cast me into hell. If I got what I deserve, death and hell, like instantly. But instead, he saved me from death and hell. And not only that, he continues to save me. He saves me from my own dumb decisions. He saves me from my own thoughts. He saves me from my own sins that I commit each and every day against him. I can mess something up in my life and God's there to put it back on track. He saves. He saved and continues to save. Why? Because he's a merciful God. I don't deserve that. His truth, it says... His truth endureth to all generations. There it is again. It endureth. It keeps going and going and going and going. The Bible says that His truth is a shield and buckler. It's a protection for us. Having the Word of God, having the truth in our hands, that'll keep you safe. And that's a wonderful thing. That's, that's something that is a blessing to us. We ought to be thankful for the Word of God, for His truth that endures, but not only that, that He would have it fit in his infinite and wonderful wisdom and mercy and goodness towards us to put it in our hands. Where I can go to the Dollar Tree and buy like a hundred of them for a hundred dollars. hundred copies of the living word of God that endureth forever. In some countries, it's illegal to hold us a, a, a torn page of it. Okay, the word of God is banned. And yet here we are with this wonderful truth in our hands, a shield and a buckler to us that endureth forever. Be thankful for that. The Word of God is incredibly deep and rich, and it's a great responsibility to even have it. We have a light. We're to be a lamp in this world. This Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and we're to take that and go with it so that one day we can stand upon a hill and be that lighthouse so that all men would look unto it and live. It's the only reason I can think of that God would give me His Word is that I could share it. That it could change me, and therefore others might see and fear. That I could show somebody how to be saved. I'm thankful for that. God is good. God is merciful. God is truth and gave us the enduring truth. And we ought to be thankful for that. So let's start to be thankful. Be thankful in all things. Not in many things, not in most things, not in only the things that feel good. Be thankful in all things. This is the will of God concerning Christ Jesus. Some simple, practical ways from this psalm that we can be thankful and show our thankfulness is to make a joyful noise unto God. Sing unto God your praises. Serve the Lord. Do good unto others. Take a command and just obey it. Pick one. I'm going to work on this. Being patient. Know him. This is a good one. We need to know the Lord. He is God, but know, know who the Lord is as God. Get to know him. Seek him. And you'll find him. Enter into his presence often and with thanksgiving and with praise unto him. Just a few simple practicals. God is worthy of them. Why? He's good. He was merciful unto you, and he gave you his truth. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, for, the, for this day and for you. I just, I just thank you for 